Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome you all uh, here today. Uh, we have the pleasure to receive uh, Professor Isidro Morales from, from Mexico. Um, actually, we, we had the proposal, he proposed himself uh, to give this lecture today because he was visiting Denmark and he thought uh, maybe it was interesting for us uh, to see what's going on in uh, North America and what they believe is going to be the impact uh, uh, globally. So I don't know how much we'll be discussing uh, politics. We're engineers here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a tough audience, Isidro. Yeah. Um, wh what we will have today is a, is a lecture of, um, I'm not sure how long, around 45 minutes, an hour. And then we should have some time for, for discussion, hopefully. Uh, I should introduce uh, Isidro. Uh, Isidro is, uh, is a bit French somehow, he's a bit Danish also. Um, I've heard that he got his PhD from, from France, uh, uh, Institut d'études politiques in Paris. Uh, then he was in, in Denmark for some time. Uh, he was a lecturer at the University of Copenhagen and guest researcher at the Danish Center for Development Research. Uh, and then I think part of your career was in the US, uh, mainly in, uh, in Washington. I'm not going to go through the, the whole CV, but he, he was also a dean of the School of Social Science at the Universidad de las Americas Puebla in Mexico, and, uh, and again, a, a Fulbright scholar in the US in Washington. And recently, you moved to Monterrey. Um, so that's where he's based now. And if I remember well, uh, you're the director of the public administration uh, department. He's the editor in chief of the Latin, Latin American policy a journal, which is a wider journal, and also um, a director of foreign policy for a bi monthly magazine uh, edited and published by EGAP. Um, today, we will uh, discuss the question of emergence of non conventional fuels in North America and the application for world energy markets. We also ask for a bit of a smart grid, uh, if it's possible, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Isidro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, I, I would like to thank to uh, Pierre Panson uh, for his invi kind invitation for being with you. And uh, as he said, I studied in France, so it was I didn't have the opportunity to talk French with you anyway, uh, because uh, the English is a lingua franca here uh, in Europe, and especially in this subject as uh, energy. And, and I would like to thank also to uh, my son. Uh, Esteban Morales, he's here, he's a, a student, he's making his PhD at the ETU, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for coming here. I know that uh, it's not easy because you are ending your holiday, so you are starting to work, so thank you for uh, sparing one hour, two hours for being here. Um, well, I know I'm with a very tough audience, I'm not a scientist myself, as you heard. I'm rather uh, biased towards the economic and political side of the question. Uh, but I, uh, talking with Pierre and talking with um, uh, Esteban, uh, what we consider to be uh, of interest of, uh, for you uh, as a general audience, more on the scientific side, is to give um, a general um, idea of what I call the energy revolution in North America, what is taking place now in North America, mainly uh, in the domain of non-conventional fuels, uh, shale gas and shale oil or tight gas or tight oil. Uh, how this is impacting not only North America, but with some consequences for the rest of the world. So this is gonna be more or less my, my presentation. Um, I, at the very end, I, I uh, make some reference to the Mexican side because, as probably you know, uh, in Mexico we are about to discuss a new energy reform in order to uh, jump into the wagon of uh, non-conventional fuels. So, um, uh, the general idea that I want to transmit to all of you is that uh, uh, for the U.S., uh, as in Europe, but especially for the U.S., uh, energy has been has traditionally been a security issue, a national security issue. And for that, it's very simple. They have understood the capacity to access energy resources 
at uh, reasonable prices or the balance between the um, cost of opportunity for accessing uh, energy that are not available in their own uh, territory. So uh, what I'm showing here is just two uh, uh, general images. Um, um, here are the evolution of prices, international prices. These are real prices in uh, 2011 uh, dollars, and these are um, market prices. So what is interesting to see here is that we have two major peaks. And this peak uh, at the uh, beginning of the 70s and mid 80s was considered in the US as, a, as an energy crisis. I mean, in, in the policy jargon was called the energy crisis. And there were some projects in order to make the US independent, which was uh, rather ridiculous. But uh, what they want is to diversify their uh, mainly oil supplies from the Middle East. And then uh, we have a slowdown of the market, mainly to the uh, previous period. And then we are in the midst of a new oil peak in which prices real in real terms are higher than in the early 80s. And what's interesting is that uh, from um, the turn of the century, the uh, Bush government, especially uh, his vice president, Dick Cheney, um, he um, admitted that the US was confronting a new energy crisis and he uh, called for a major study in order to cope with the crisis. And for him, the crisis was quite similar to what uh, was in, in previous era, the dependence on net oil imports compared to consumption. As you may see here, uh, net imports raised a maximum historical of uh, almost 60%. You may see it here, 60%. Uh, at the middle of the past decade. So those two ideas, a, a new price hike and oil dependence, which uh, reached historical records, uh, were considered to uh, uh, create a new energy crisis for the US. And the answer uh, was much more complex, much more complicated than uh, in the 70s. Because uh, if you read that uh, Dick Cheney report, which is very interesting, um, you may uh, um, be aware that they were considering two fronts in order to attack the crisis. The first front was uh, uh, energy diplomacy, uh, how to diversify uh, oil imports from the Middle East, uh, how to strengthen the relationship with um, um, what they call non-Middle East or even non-OPEC uh, uh, oil sources. And by saying this, mainly Canada, Mexico, and most of the Western Hemisphere, and some countries of Africa, and some countries of former Soviet Union. And the second one was to raise domestic production. And in order to raise, you say, how uh, to raise domestic production when, as we know, domestic oil and gas production, mainly oil, was being uh, falling down. Uh, well, the key point here in this new uh, energy policy was to strengthen technological innovation. That's why I'm very glad to be here. Uh, how to uh, provoke uh, technological change in order to uh, uh, make available uh, on a cost basis uh, 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 affordable uh, a new energy supply. That's the, the key point. Uh, what I could call a kind of Schumpeterian revolution in the US compared to the past in which more uh, market reforms and geopolitical considerations were taken into place. This new approach was more Schumpeterian in the sense that they bet to technological change in order to enhance the supply of domestic resources, and those domestic resources, as now we know, uh, were non-conventional fossil fuels, but not only that, also renewables. So the two of them 
they were discussed at that time. And um, we see rapidly the, the consequences. First, um, as we know, in the case of Canada, he became a major oil producer because um, Canadians, uh, they also made their own revolution uh, with the coming on stream of bitumen, of torsons, and they uh, became second, only second rank to Saudi Arabia in terms of their reserves. And look at also uh, Venezuela, also uh, uh, they upgraded the reserves of heavy oil. Um, and in terms of gas, as we know, uh, still the uh, Middle East and uh, former Soviet Union countries, uh, they have the major resources. Um, and then, um, Canadians became or strengthened their geopolitical um, uh, relation, energy relationship with the U.S. Uh, by becoming the first supplier of the U.S., they went into 10% of net oil import to almost 30% now, which is a huge change. Uh, not even Europe has that possibility because in, in Europe relies on uh, Russian gas. We, we want to see here that also the U.S. rely on uh, Canadian natural gas. Uh, but Canada is a, a very compatible country with the U.S. and it's fully integrated, we want to see it. Um, so the first technological revolution it came from uh, the Canadians when they accepted that their um, tar sands were uh, recoverable, economic recoverable reserves, and um, increased their production and became uh, displaced Saudi Arabia as a major oil supplier, and of course, place also Mexico, because uh, Mexico went the other way around, we're gonna see it. And in the, in the terms of gas as well, look at how in terms of gas, Canada uh, became, or has been, confirm his position as the major supplier of the U.S. Now, um, in terms of energy, North America is uh, de facto integrated, but in the case of Canada, the U.S. is also legally and formally integrated because they have uh, the Canadian-U.S. free trade agreement, which turned into NAFTA later on. But as we know, uh, Mexico, uh, didn't accept the uh, um, energy chapter into NAFTA. Well, they, uh, Mexicans made some exceptions. Uh, energy is into NAFTA, also for Mexicans, but with a lot of exceptions, with, I will come back to this. But in the case of Canada, they really open markets uh, in, in terms of energy. Uh, and um, uh, they um, um, reinforce their integration via uh, um, pipelines, in this case of liquids, and um, via gas lines, which are not saying they are private, most of them are private. But what I'm trying to show here is that uh, um, there is a de facto and there is a formal uh, integration uh, in Canada as it exists in the uh, European Union. Um, uh, and with this major revolution coming from Canada, puts uh, North America in a, in a very uh, privileged position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Europeans, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, as we're going to see later on. Now, once the um, um, tar sands revolution started, uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of, the, uh, uh, of, of this century, and the, the middle of this century, another revolution um, appeared in North America, in this case in the U.S., which is not a discovery because we knew that uh, tar sands and uh, uh, yeah, we knew that um, shale gas and shale oil and tight oil and tight gas existed already in the world, but that there were no uh, the, um, the technology in order to uh, explore it uh, in, in, order to, in order to make it feasible in economic terms. And this was a reality, this became a reality 
uh, at the turn of this century, and the revolution started in the US. The, I'm showing here the last map issued by the uh, US Energy Department, which was published in April of this year, which is updating the assessment of uh, shale gas reserves. Of course, they are not assessing all over the world. They are not assessing the Middle East or the, uh, those areas which are heavily endowed of conventional fuels because they still have conventional fuels. But those areas which uh, uh, are outside the Middle East, which is also very important because the first impact of this uh, technological revolution is that um, uh, reserves uh, have increased outside the Middle East. Um, uh, most of the new discoveries and most of the assessment, most of the technical recovery reserves are outside the Middle East, which is, and they are, uh, most of them they are in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we, may say, uh, we see not in Europe. At any case, in France, they are forbidden. So, and uh, and in China, in fact, uh, uh, China, excuse me, um, China has uh, been considered as uh, uh, is ranked uh, the, uh, in the first place of the, because of its amount of shale reserves so far. Um, and the US in second place. Canada in fourth place. And Mexico in fifth place. So North America is very well positioned because uh, if we add all the three countries, uh, at least one uh, fourth of technical recovery reserves of shale gas are in North America. So this is part of this, uh, these major changes. And then I'm trying to show here uh, how is the case in North America. Uh, this is also the, new, the latest uh, assessment of the Department of Energy. Uh, you can they see that major plays are here in the Marcellus, the Marcellus place, which includes many several states. Here, the, um, in Texas as well, which are part of the Mexican geological uh, reservoir as well, are here also in the back end, which is a cross-border region with uh, Canada and the US. So, I mean, the new reserves, they don't know the political limits of the three countries. Now, this is a table showing you comparing the amount of uh, non conventional fuels with conventional fuels in uh, both uh, oil and gas. And what we see, I'm just comparing with uh, proof reserves, um, which normally they are lower. And what you may see here is that um, uh, in terms of uh, shale, uh, North America, which is here, no, ranks 25% of non-conventional, while they only have 13% of crude reserves, shale oil. In terms of gas, it's 24%, but they only have 5% of crude reserve gas. So this is in terms of geopolitics uh, or, or the economics and politics of uh, um, energy resources is extremely important. Um, and you may say also the position of China in terms of um, shale oil, which is 9%, and conventional oil, 1%, shale gas, which is huge, 15% on itself, and 1% of proved reserves of conventional gas, and the positioning of uh, Russia. No, I put it here. Okay, so you may have your, um, you can make your own deductions, just comparing this table. Now, uh, what is important in the um, in the U.S. is that, as I told you, uh, they followed a, a, a two-tier approach: one internationally uh, to make the right uh, alliances with key partners, in this case with Canada and Mexico, even through trade agreements. Um, and also, um, uh, uh, for Americas, as it was written in this Gini report, 
uh, for that, the most important is to make both oil and gas a global commodity. They wanted to globalize the market. And as you know, gas is very difficult to, to become global so far uh, because of transportation. Normally, uh, natural gas was uh, uh, marketed through gas line. But now, uh, thanks to the economics of, of, the, of uh, the technology of, uh, the, uh, of energy markets, a, a growing market of LNG liquefy natural gas is possible. So, and with the new discoveries of shale gas, and with a reduction of costs of, 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 of gas as we're gonna see now, there is the possibility that natural gas becomes a global commodity such as oil. So one of the major international goals of the US is to uh, make both oil and gas a commodity. And the dream is to make it as an, another commodity, as potatoes, as uh, Cooper, whatever you call it. But this is not realistic that's because we know that the distribution of uh, energy resources is completely asymmetrical. Uh, conventional fuels are still mainly located in the Middle East, as you saw it in my second slide. So there will be always geopolitical considerations in that are impacting prices, the, uh, the construction of prices. So that's why it has become a strategic commodity, and that's why prices, even now for oil, they reflect that uncertainty, that geopolitical uncertainty. That's why they are still too high. And at the same time, there are market pressures explaining the new um, uh, oil peak or oil uh, price increase, as I showed you. Uh, this is due uh, mainly to the behavior of Chinese and Indian demand, or mainly Asian demand. Uh, currently, um, um, half of uh, oil demand is in the OCD countries, and the other half is in non-OCD. In the coming uh, 20, 30 years, uh, the OECD demand will remain steady, and the non-OECD demand will double. So uh, it's clear, and all the for forecasts coincide in this, that uh, prices will be uh, stressed, will be under pressure, because of non-OECD demand, mainly uh, economic growth coming from China, India, the Middle East, and some key Latin American countries like uh, Brazil, and to a less degree, Argentina. Now, what I'm showing here is a domestic front. In the domestic front, the United States, they um, changed their fiscal policy in order to uh, give a different kind of, they call it tax expenditures, which is our uh, tax reductions. Um, to uh, different uh, producers of uh, energies. What is interesting here is that in the first shock hmm, during the uh, 70s and 80s, most of these uh, tax expenditures went into conventional fuels hmm, to try to develop domestic supply of conventional oil and gas. And uh, gas was extremely benefited from this policy. But at the same time, there were policies oriented towards um, um, efficiency, mainly uh, in public buildings or in home appliances, uh, and in um, also in non-conventional uh, fuels, no? very, very few. What is interesting is here, during this period, as you saw it in my first slide, international prices collapsed or went down. And the US followed a, a market-oriented approach in the sense that oil, conventional oil became very cheap. So there was no question to subsidize uh, domestic production, production or to subsidize um, efficiency or energy savings. So they followed a, a rather a market approach, mainly uh, from the Reagan years. So 
what is interesting is how uh, most of the of these um, uh, uh, transfers they were heavily reduced. They are measured in real prices, in real dollars. And what is interesting here is in the new uh, energy cycle, in the new oil cycle, most of the subventions go non to conventional oil, non to conventional fuels, fossil fuels, which are blue. Here, they were oriented towards, towards non conventional fuel, which is uh, shale oil and shale gas, especially if they subsidize drilling because costs were very high at that time. But also to renewables, as you may say here, to renewables and to conservation and energy. So they changed their fiscal policy in order to uh, um, push this upcoming technological revolution in order to make possible uh, the enhancement of domestic supply, but this time not uh, betting on conventional fuels, but on non-conventional. And this is what's on purpose, because if you read the Chini report, which was released uh, in 2001, March, no, uh, before the, yeah, March, yeah, before the attack of the Twin Towers, um, they already spoke about the new technologies for um, developing non-conventional gas and oil, such as horizontal drilling and uh, hydraulic uh, fracking, which are the, 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 the two major technological changes that uh, made possible this. And um, shale gas and tight gas, those are that are geologists, they know it better than, than me. They come from different geological formations, but the methodology to uh, exploit them is similar by um, horizontal drilling and uh, hydraulic uh, fracking. So that's why uh, most of the time you want to see that Americans, they combine shale with tight gas, uh, shale with tight oil. They are different. They come from different geological formations, but since uh, that technology used for exploiting them is similar, it's the same one. So that's why it made possible to de develop those different places. Now, I have still 15, 20 minutes left, I suppose. Yeah? Okay. Um, so this is the result. Uh, there's no magic. It was. Uh, um, um, some policies, of it, not only fiscal policies, of course. Uh, Amer the Americans, they have uh, 20 national laboratories, 20 national laboratories like this one, like 20 DTUs spread out in the country, which make research just on energy, of new technologies on, en on energy, and they work according to the American system with private companies in order to develop different type of, of technology, including of course, uh, solar and photovoltaic um, and hydrogen technology. Uh, they are still supporting uh, the research on uh, putting to market um, uh, hydrogen uh, cars. So uh, it's, the, uh, it's the number one in the world uh, of sponsoring research linked to technology. I know that Denmark is one of them, but the US, because of its uh, economy, um, its, uh, its geopolitical uh, interests, they are uh, pushing hard the research on new technologies for uh, not only impacting, that's important, not only impacting supply, but impacting demand, impacting the, not only impacting the way uh, uh, any resources are going to be um, developed, but the way they are going to be consumed. And this is quite unique. And this is, for me, the real Jupiterian, from Jupiter, the real Jupiterian um, success of the country. Because no other country, as far as I know, not all, all, all the energy power, because it has become an energy power, as far as I know, has developed that capabilities of impacting both the supply side of energy and the demand side, the way to 
uh, make the consumption, the way to consume that energy, uh, which is imp impacting different markets, the different markets of energy. I want to I want to come back to this quite soon. So um, impact here. This is um, in terms of crude oil, this is Thai oil. And this is a scenario that a uh, business as usual scenario, which means that if current policies are, which are put in place follow the same way, they are going to develop this uh, tight oil boom in the following seven to eight years, and then it's going to decline. But if policies continue, of course, the boom might continue. Uh, what is interesting here is the scenarios for shale and tight gas which are to be considered as a real boom in the years to come, just in a business as usual scenario. Which these two scenarios, so these two um, uh, accomplishments that we are witnessing now, both in the oil, domestic oil side and the domestic gas side, have their implications. The major, one of the major implications is that perhaps gas will become a global commodity as Americans want it. Why? We're going to see that here, for example, this is the ratio between the price of um, oil, international price, uh, and uh, the Brent, using as a benchmark the Brent uh, oil, with uh, um, natural gas in terms of their calorific equivalent, which normally is measured on BTUs, British Thermal Units. So um, here, when the ratio is 1, which was in the 90s, means that in terms of um, uh, is a energy equivalent, uh, oil was as expensive as gas or vice versa. Gas was as expensive as oil. So oil wa uh, gas prices were linked to the energy equivalent of oil, which was very high, as we know. No? Uh, but progressively, they became decoupled. And you may see here that currently, their gas is seven times cheaper, or oil is seven times more expensive than gas, whatever you may see it. In other words, gas has become cheap compared to oil. So it has become very attractive, at least in the US, but also in the world, to substitute uh, gas uh, mainly in the power sector for generating electricity with other fuels. Some countries, they still use oil, which is not fashionable anymore, but especially coal. So gas has become cheaper than coal in the energy sector. So gas has become, and it's supposed to be cleaner, for those, it's supposed to be cleaner because it's less contaminated, it has less content of carbon, uh, more environmentally friendly, for those that are, that are not environmentalist, at least. Uh, so uh, what we have seen is uh, a, a, an increase in domestic demand of gas compared to other uh, fuels. So that's one of the major impact in terms of economics. And, uh, and as, according to this uh, slide, uh, the, uh, they are forecasting that uh, uh, the price of gas will remain cheaper than oil in the future, which means that there will be uh, an attractive, it will be very attractive for Americans to uh, uh, increase production also for exp uh, exports. So for the first time, but not for the first time, but after many years, uh, Americans, they have visualized that they could become not only self-sufficient of gas, because as we saw, they are reported from Canada, but that they could become net exporters. And to become net exporters could be in just seven years, as we were seeing, just seven years. Another revolution. What is this revolution? Americans are not only impacting uh, prices, of course, here is a regional market because it's the Henry Hub, which set the price for Canada and Mexico. Nothing to do with European gas prices or Asian gas prices. But if 
that commodity becomes global, sooner or later they will converge as oil. So it means that it's probable, I cannot affirm because we are a scientist, it's probable, like he, uh, Pierre is an expert of probabilistics, so I cannot say that it's going to happen, but it's probable um, uh, gas prices will go down also in Europe, uh, in Asia, if the shale gas revolution continues, compared to oil, altering different policy choices that has been made in the world in terms of other fuels, not only oil, but also alternatives fuel, and coal. So think about it. Now, in terms of imports, as I told you, can, uh, Americans are going to be net exporters. And here is just an estimation. It is assumed that most of the exports will go to Mexico because Mexico has become a net importer of gas. How come? We have huge reserves of gas, but I will come back. And uh, also, it could become, or it has become already, it's already yeah, uh, becoming an LNG exporter. Americans were constructing until five or seven years ago LNG terminals in order to import gas from Qatar. Now they are adapting those terminals in order to export LNG outside Mexico because uh, Mexico they can export via uh, gas line. So see how it changes so, so rapidly uh, 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 this scenario. Now, um, here I present uh, five scenarios, official scenarios from the Department of Energy, depicting the evolution, the probable evolution of liquid fuels. Now, I explain gas, now liquid fuels, which mainly is petroleum, but since now they are biofuels, so they call it liquid fuels. I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, accurate to say now, to speak about liquid fuels. And more and more we're gonna talk about liquid fuels because as we know, we can get liquids from coal, we can get liquids from gas. Americans, they have developed the technology and perhaps also in Denmark and Europe, they also are following these trends. But here, what's interesting is that this is the business as usual scenario, which means, remember I talked about oil dependency, hmm? how high it became uh, in the mid 90s, and then how it has been reduced, no? thanks to the increase of domestic production. But if we continue the reference case, uh, net dependency will not be reduced in the longer term, it will, it will stabilize which is already a major success, let's, let's say it this way. But, but what about if current non-fossil fuels um, productivity is higher than estimated? Because I'm not a geologist, but according to geologists, there's a geological variable. Uh, since they are non-conventional, uh, some um, place could be much more productive than predicted or less productive. And I, 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 I'm sure that there will be a geologist, at least here. Uh, but what I understand is that uh, the way to estimate uh, the uh, possible reserve of, uh, of a basin is not is different from conventional fuels from non-conventional. So it's m much more difficult to assess the real uh, technical recovery reserves from non-conventional fuels. So, it could be, and this is another scenario of the Department of Energy, that uh, the productivity of the place could be 100% higher or 50% less. This is completely for heuristic reasons. So you have a scenario where the productivity can be higher or lower, but they put a figure 100% higher or 50% lower. So what happens? So we move from the business as usual scenario, we go higher productivity here, the 
all independence of the liquid fuel depends will fall down to just 7% of consumption. It is 40% for circa. It will go to 7% just if the productivity of the non-conventional place are the double. And if they are 50% less, it will increase not very much to um, 42%. Okay? And now, for the first time, the Department of Energy, you know that they have these publications yearly. For the first time, they have published another two scenarios showing what if we have this higher productivity or lower productivity, but at the same time, we have higher efficiency in demand. We reduce demand thanks not only to new policies for efficiency, but with a marketing of non-conventional vehicles, which you have here. The plug-in, the hybrids, the hydrogen, those different kinds of flexible, hmm? they combine with um, air fuels. Hmm? Or the opposite, if we fail to do that, because uh, uh, they have different uh, way of uh, reinforcing the efficiency of engines. They have the uh, famous CAFE, the Covered Average uh, Fuel Economy Standard in the US, which every five years is increasing the efficiency of um, mileage per gallon for automobiles in the US, and it's mandatory. So if we have high productivity plus higher efficiency, Americans will become, for the first time, net plus fuel, uh, liquid fuels. Or they will increase their dependency, but not to the level that they wished in the new bed. So these are just heuristic, of course. It's, it's a range. We have to consider it as a possible range, as a scope of uh, uh, possible policies, possible paths to follow. I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, the evolution will be something in between. For example, they estimate, or all estimate, we all estimate that oil prices will continue growing. It won't be that case, we know that. Because we have to think, what if, what will be the impact of a new supply of shale oil or what will be the impact of a more shale gas substituting other fuels? Probably it will impact oil prices, and probably oil prices will go down. And this is not only an economic puzzle, it's a political puzzle, because we know that uh, normally prices go down and stay, uh, go up and stay up, because there is a cartel, and not a drug trafficking cartel as we not have in Mexico, uh, but a producer's cartel, which is OPEC. And normally, uh, OPEC has the possibility of manipulating their own supply in order to keep prices high. But if the, if the pressure is too high, what, what does it mean? If spur capacitor, OPEC, spur capacity remains too high, there will be strong temptation for some key OPEC members to increase the production and to push prices back. We saw that in the mid 80s. So, and these estimations, they, uh, they, they presuppose that oil prices will keep going, it will keep increasing in 50% in real terms. They have different scenarios. They have scenarios also to go down. But once again, which is the floor, which is the ceiling? And I consider that the floor, I mean, the bottom line where oil prices go, go down, is the price of substitution, not to compromise the new technologies that are in place for uh, non conventional fuels and also for renewables. And uh, the bottom line for the top for a ceiling, excuse me, uh, will be not to provoke a major 
economic crisis, which collapsed uh, demands. But this, this is what an economist would say. Economists love to say, let's suppose that OPEC does not exist. Let's suppose that Iraq does not exist. Let's suppose that Mexicans do not exist. So oil will be a global commodity. But since there is a lot of politics, there is a lot of um, externalities affecting um, the market, is quite difficult to predict. But at least what these scenarios show us is a march of maneuver that Americans have in international markets. And it gives us the scope, of the possibilities, what they can impact, not only in the supply side, but in uh, the demand side. That's the whole idea to discuss with you. Well, I want to, Harry, uh, here we have also another scenario that could impact domestic demand in the US. What if um, an ecological or climate change policy is introduced? I have introduced economic uh, variables. I have introduced geological variables. I have, spo I have spoken about political variables. For example, Iraq produces around 2.53 million barrels a day much less its capacity. Why? Well, because Iraq has been in war since the mid-80s. Since the mid-80s with Iran, and then with Kuwait, and then Americans went into Kuwait, said they saved Kuwait, <laughs> pushed Iraq, and they put an embargo. They could only export for human reasons, and the uh, United Nations were administering the embargo. And then we know the catastrophic end, the war of March uh, 2003. So Iran has been producing only up to 2.5, up to 3 million barrels a day. And according to some um, uh, surveys, like the International Energy Agency, they are considering now that Iraq is in peace, so to speak, under the domain of the US, perhaps, under the protection of an umbrella of the US, Iraq could produce up to 10 million barrels a day in 20 years, which could easily rival Saudi Arabia. But that's political scenario. Now, ecological scenario, which I think Danes love. So what if in America they put a cost to um, expel carbon? Because in America, to expel carbon is still free, not like here. Carbon costs nothing still. So if they put a um, kind of tax or whatever you call it, uh, to um, the emission of carbon or to some uh, climate change uh, uh, or to um, uh, greenhouse gases, you may see how the demand of renewables in the electricity sector could jump and displace carbon or even gas. So it could affect also the uh, demand of gas. But it won't stop it. It won't stop uh, the shell gas revolution, this kind of taxes, because they could always export to uh, environmental uh, not tax uh, uh, countries. By contrast, what, what if environmental concerns go to the way shale plays are being exploited? We know that they are highly contaminated as the tar sands. They need a lot of water. They put sand water, chemicals, in order to make the fracking. And then they have to re recover that water. And the problem is the waste disposal. So it's highly contaminated. In America, there's no federal ruling uh, contemplating this. So the solution has been handled on a state-by-state -state cases. 
In the case of Pennsylvania, where the Marcellus Plague is, as I told you, in the case of Pennsylvania, they have followed a rather generous environmental policy, generous towards shale producers, because they have legitimized the legislation in order not to stop the economic impact of developing shale gas versus the uh, environmental damage they could say. So it's another variable that we have to take into account. And if there is a federal legislation in order to regulate, severely regulate uh, the exploitation of shale gas, this will stop or this will alter or affect shale gas production. But all our variables that uh, uh, we still don't know how they're going to evolve. For those that love to make general equilibrium analysis in order to see what's happened. And the same with uh, non-conventional vehicles, as I put it here. This is the, the mainstream perception of how they're going to evolve. Uh, so they, uh, um, they estimate that uh, plug-in and um, uh, flexible fuels vehicles will come, uh, will continue growing in the years to come. So um, just general consequences, as you may see, the uh, gas revolution is located in uh, North America. And you know, uh, at any rate, North America will become self-sufficient if we, if we summarize the production of both Canada and the US. It will be a net exporting region at any rate. I mean, regardless the different um, uh, uncertainties I already mentioned, compared to Europe, which will keep importing uh, gas, this case gas, or even China. It's very interesting to, uh, to see in, in Mexico, at least they say that China is a new power, it's an emerging power. Well, yes, of course, it's an emerging power, but, 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 in terms of energy, China is very well, bad located, uh, not because of resources, but because of technology. That's another strength of Americans. They have developed the technology. So they are becoming a great exporter, the companies, great exporters of uh, service technologies on the uh, non conventional fuels industry. Right. Now, last but not least, Mexico. The, the Mexican case is quite strange. Um, Canada and the US have increased the reserve, have increased the production, have increased. Uh, in the case of Canada, the exports. Uh, Americans are about to become net exporters of gas. They could eventually become uh, self sufficient in oil. But Mexicans, uh, their production is declining. Um, reserves are declining. Production has severely declined. And this is because Mexico relied in just one basin. Um, the Cantrell Basin, which is located in uh, offshore Gulf of Mexico, close to Campeche. And the Cantrell Basin it used to provide almost 60% over overall production in the country. Very good, great for the Mexicans, but they were very vulnerable. Because if uh, the basin is overexploited or, or it just depleted, of course, Sooner or later, they will run on problems. And this is our case. We still don't know whether we have overexploited the, the basin or it's just a normal decline. The question is that only one company can, only one company knows that. And only two or three persons know that. Because we have a monopoly. Uh, in Mexico, uh, oil natural resources, as almost in all over the world, belo belong to the nation. In Canada, they belong to the nation. In Brazil, they belong to the nation. In Norway, also, they belong to the nation. Uh, only in the, in, in the United States, they are privatized. But in contrast with other countries in Mexico, they not only belong to the nation, but they only belong to one company. In Norway, in Canada, in Brazil, there are many companies. In Canada, it's incredible because they didn't belong to the province. Alberta is much more richer than Ontario now. 
not the whole federation, because most of the uh, non-commercial reserves are in, in Alberta. In the case of Mexico, they belong to a company, and they are being used and misused by the company. And there's no transparency, I have to say. There's no transparency in the way that the resources are being used and depleted. So, in some way, this explains how suddenly the Mexican positioning changed very rapidly. And uh, Mexico now is striving first to stop the decline in resource. And then the uh, major quandary, as I summarize it here, is whether to um, uh, develop its potential, because Mexico has a huge potential. Just, I know that's very difficult to see it, but I want to tell you. Here we have the historical record of what has been produced in Mexico since the end of the 19th century up to the present, which is around about 45 billion barrels, okay? And here we have all the three types of reserves, which is around 45. So we have more or less the same of reserves, total reserves, as we have already produced in all our history. Not that bad. But we also have the same amount more, 54, of prospective reserves. And we have much more of non-conventional reserves, which is shale gas, shale oil. So we have three times more in Mexico of the same amount that we have produced historically historically since the uh, end of the 19th century to the present. So we have we have the resources. But in contrast with the US and Canada, we don't have the institutional capacity. We don't have the technological capacity to develop it, even though Mexicans say they have. Well, those working in Penix. If anyone of Penix is here, I'm sure that he will come as, yes, we have. Um, no, they don't. And the major discussion is whether uh, these results have to be developed uh, in joint venture or with some alliance with private companies, be, be in them Mexicans or international companies, or they will be developed as business as usual in the same pattern of monopolization, not transparency, corruption, misuse, and so on and so forth. And this is the quid of what is going to be discussed in, uh, from tomorrow, because uh, as far as I learned, tomorrow our president is going to submit a new energy reform and we'll see what it's going to be. Well, now, the, the point is that Mexico, is, uh, its exports are declining, its production is declining, its imports are jumping, because we have also problems in the downstream sector, so we have discussed whether Mexico will open the downstream sector, because also the downstream sector is heavily monopolized. It's monopolized by one company, the same company. And here I show you the potential of shale gas and oil gas, which is located, and uh, some of them are the natural extension of Eagle Ford. Eagle Ford is a major play in Texas that is developing shale gas, the gas boom. And it's a natural continuation of Eagle Ford here, the uh, Sabinas and uh, Burgos Basin, which are in northern Mexico. But also in Veracruz and also in Yucatan, there are possibilities. But we also have not only organizational problems, we have not only technological handicaps, we have infrastructure handicaps. Remember I showed you how Canada is intertwined with the US in terms of gas pipelines and oil pipelines. In Mexico, we need gas lines if we want to develop. The blue ones are potential. They are under construction. They are a vision by Mexicans to be constructed. And the uh, black ones, they are what they will exist. So look at the connection. The, the gas, the conventional, conventional gas vessels are here. Uh, they are, we have just one major gas line that pump it to the northern industrial north, and then here. And that's it. And the rest is imported from the US. We um, 
flare gas. We burn it because we cannot sell it here. It goes by tanks, by four wheels, which is very uneconomical. Mexico has already privatized the construction of gas lines since the NAFTA years. Remember that I told you that NAFTA banned the energy sector, but it opened uh, the construction of gas lines and the import of gas and the import of electricity. But there has not been investments, private investments, very few investments here. Why? I can explain that if you stay here because I only have two minutes and uh, 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 what is going to say? Hello, if all. For Finia. I might finish. And that part of list here is Mexico is currently importing LNG. Why are we importing LNG if Mexico is beside the US with equal for booming, with the shale gas booming? How come? Ah, because Mexico doesn't have the infrastructure, all the infrastructure for import all the gas it needs from the US. So we have built a new LNG terminal in Altamira, no, Altamira, no, Mazanillo, which is in the Pacific. Going to import gas from Qatar and from Bolivia. Because we don't have enough gas lights. And this is the wishful thinking or the wishful dream of the uh, Calderon years when he said he dreamed that Mexico has the technology and Mexico has the possibility to develop shale gas. Just uh, in order to finish, let me tell you that Mexico has drilled three fields of shale gas. I have the figures here, but I'm going to stop. And it cost $12 million to drill one well. And it's publicly known, publicly known. While in Eagle Ford, it cost us four up to five million dollars. So Pemex is uh, investing the double in order to develop a well that is similar to the Eagle Ford area. So that's why I'm saying that Mexico has no has not technology or is heavily inefficient or is heavily corrupt. I don't know. But, and that's it. So the major conclusions are that both Canada and the US are becoming major players in oil and gas markets. Canada is uh, anticipated to boost its production up to six, more than six million barrels daily in, um, in 15 years, which is very important. Um, the US could become an exporter in five years, a net exporter because of exporting to Mexico, net exporter. Um, um, Mexico's decline in production is a major problem. But uh, the revolution that is happening in the North, both in the US and Canada, is affecting uh, the uh, policy choices of Mexico. And I'm quite sure that this new demand for reform will be extremely shaped, but uh, considering what is going on in the US and Canada. Um, and North America will become, has become self-sufficient in many ways, which is also very important as a region. Um, and the most important conclusion is that uh, uh, for the first time, uh, America is impacting global markets, not necessarily because uh, they are able to increase their domestic demand, uh, supply, not necessarily because they are able to shape the evolution of demand, but because they have the technology for continually transforming energy markets in the uh, years to come. That's the key message of my presentation. So that's why I call, I say that uh, we we are witnessing a kind of Jupiterian revolution in energy markets in which innovation has become extremely important uh, in order to um, impact not only conventional fuels, not only non-conventional fuels, but also renewables. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, 
Yeah, why well, you want to start? Uh, you're going to have to talk in the microphone so that we can record the questions too. Hi, my name is Stella Semino. I am from Argentina. And we got um, a recent discovery of gas, anyway, Vaca Muertes. The Vaca Muertes, yes, it's yeah. very well known, yes. And it's in the hands of Chevron now. Uh, I find about technology, my, my first big concern about the technology, because uh, I, I feel that it's a bubble. Think that we are in an economic crisis, and these type of stories are quite good for, for, for the markets. Then uh, about the technology, it, uh, I now I am going a bit out from 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 energy, but it's about food and she am food and it's the technology and is the magic uh, sort of recipe. So I know that in Canada and in the U.S. there are a lot of complaints about contamination of water with this technology. So there is, a, in, in, in what you presented, I think that there is another dimension that you didn't explore, and it's, it's, it's about the human and planetary factor, you know, because it's actually it's a quite aggressive technology, and, and we cannot make a sort of a 20, 30 year scenario in something that is very weak, especially now that we are in need of these bubbles in order to keep going as economy. So that is uh, my point, and anyway, maybe. no, no, it's very, it's very well taken. Stila, Stila, it's very well taken, and and, and thanks for recalling me uh, the, um, uh, the place of uh, Vaca Muerta in Argentina, which is, uh, uh, as I said, Argentina ranks in fourth place in shale uh, gas reserves, and we have heard a lot about it since the Epsol, Epsol, uh, Repsol. Repsol for uh, yeah, and Chevron, yes. Um, okay. Well, you are correctly right in saying that these scenarios are just um, possibilities. I, I, I want that. I, I never take a scenario of, uh, on its face value. Never, ever. Because they, they, they never are like that. Never. It's, it's you make the, you read the history, you say, well, it was completely different. But, they give you the scope, uh, the trends. And what is clear is that um, uh, non-conventional fuels are impacting uh, global market. That's, that's true. To what extent, uh, how long is this going to take, we don't know. And then I was talking about variables. I refer to um, uh, technological variables, horizontal draining. Uh, hydraulic fracking, fracking. I was talking about economic variables, prices. <clears throat> I was talking about um, policy environments, uh, fiscal transfer, uh, um, uh, uh, different policies that have helped to uh, boost research for new fields and so on. And there is the political variable and the environmental variable. In fact, I made a very small reference to uh, the Pennsylvania case because there has been a lot, lot of opposition against uh, shale gas in Pennsylvania. But as I said, uh, the outcome was decided at the state level, not at the federal level. There, there's no federal legislation. There's federal legislation according to uh, legislating uh, uh, land resources and water resources, but they are extremely general. And they can easily be circumvent by industries. So, what is needed is a specific legislation for in this case, shale gas, gas because, as I said, it's highly contaminated. Of course, not only that, it, um, it provokes um, uh, seismism as well. According to some scientific research, the earthquakes are not dangerous, but they provoke earthquakes, small earthquakes. It has been proved scientifically. And the other problem is the waste disposal, especially water, water that's heavily contaminated because it has chemicals and, and, and sand. And um, the danger of contaminate also uh, water in the sub, water in the subsoil also. So the, I accept that, and this is, there's evidence of that. 
So the problem is how to regulate that. And in America, they have uh, done it at the state level. And at the state level, at least in Pennsylvania, which is one case, they have favored the shade developers because it's politics, because they played politics, because they were heavily supported, because they legitimized the development of shale gas in terms of economic recovery. You know, in America, they have this major financial crisis, and now they set, so that was a way to recover the state. So that's why the environmental lobby failed to, uh, to push a stricter legislation for uh, shale developers. But this not, this doesn't say that it's going to stay, it's going to remain this way. I'm quite sure, for example, that some surrounding states, like Ohio, for example, they are receiving the waste disposal of Pennsylvania. So I'm quite sure that there will be protests from uh, um, limiting states in order to uh, uh, make strict regulation of waste disposal and the exploitation of areas, because the, the Marcellus play is uh, uh, um, is in different uh, spread out different uh, states of the uh, uh, east at, uh, east atlantic america may, may i make a quick comment yeah. and then we should move on to another question for the others to have uh, an yeah. opportunity just for, for this point about population acceptance and the environmental viable i don't know if you know the the case study of france because that was an extremely nice case study. They have forbidden. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> the way it happened is that there was, uh, it entered the public debate and there were lobbies pushing for it. And it took only one documentary about the North American uh, story of fracking uh, that was shown on the public uh, channel. Then the population support uh, for banning fracking was so strong that the government had to go for a law that was forbidding fracking. And since then, the industrial lobby is pushing for this is revised, but it only took this one documentary on TV for the population to really push. And push. I mean, that was a very strong uh, movement. But at this the is time. politics for me. This yeah, no, no, it's politics, it, it, but that, it's that way you the, the, the environmentalists managed to make it big through the media. And it took only one evening somehow. Uh, yeah. That was one shot and it worked. So, I mean, the, the French uh, case study is really interesting, I think, for well, that. And, and if you add, it's another if, story. If you <laughs> mention that the French case study, it's also important because it depends on, on, on the, the country. Because in France, you have a strong atomic lobby. Uh, it's not like Germany. That in Germany, they, now they banned uh, uh, atomic and nuclear energy. And in France, it's the opposite. So, uh, you know, for me, it's politics. The way the message is, because of course, there must be also science in the grants, because I have uh, explored, even if I'm not a scientific on my own, but I have explored uh, the um, environmental consequences of exploiting shale plays, and there are uh, strong environmental damages, mainly in, in, in the use of uh, water, uh, water that is but for the yeah. fracking. Uh, the risk of fracking not only in terms of earthquakes, but only in contamination of water in the subsoil. Uh, but all, uh, uh, besides that, how to uh, manage the water that you have to recover uh, in order to extract the, the gas. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Maybe we should, yeah, go to the other side and then we go back here. Thank you. Paul Motors from DTU. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And I have a question for you. Um, as you showed us, we have these non-conventional resources spread all over the world. The U.S. technology, as applied in, in, in U.S., of course, can it be used in the same way all over the world with the same efficiency, or are there difference on these potentials? Yeah. Well, le uh, let me tell you that I'm not an engineer. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, as, I, as you heard, I'm, my background is in uh, economics and political science. So I'm fortunate as an engineer. But what, what I have uh, learned, or what I know, is that uh, you, may, you may apply that technology, but it depends on the ge geological uh, formation, so, yeah, and it changes. Um, so that's why it's very difficult to estimate the technical recovery. You know, the technical recovery reserves are those that can be, uh, can be recovered at any price. It could be very, very expensive. The, it, Economic recovery, that's another business. So what, what I was showing here 
that China is in first place is because it has the most technical recovery. But it doesn't mean that China has the cost benefit technology in order to do it. So that's also very important. So uh, as far as I understand, it changes according to the geological formation. Why? Uh, we're talking about what I understand, uh, tight uh, stones, tight sands. Uh, that's why you have to frack them. But it depends on the where you frack them. You, the recovery is higher or lower, and depends also on the deposits. So it's very difficult. So it's like a, even conventional oil, as I told you, Mexico was relying on just one basin, which is control 60% of overall Mexico production, which reached 3 million. Can you imagine that? Almost 2 million just for one basin, uh, because we're, they were very productive and very porous. This is not a case with shell because it's much more deep, the, 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 the stone is, is less um, permeable. So it will depend on the geology of the play. That will be my provisional response, but we have to ask for engineers and, and geologists in order to have a right answer. Uh, is there another question? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Pierre Christensen from the Danish Gas Technology Center. You were elaborating a little bit about the gas becoming a commodity in the future. And uh, I want to, to ask you if you can elaborate a little further on that, because what we have already seen in Europe is that the American consumption of coal has decreased, pushing coal into the European market, then bringing gas prices and, and coal prices to a lower level in Europe. Could you elaborate further? What can we expect further in the future? On that area. Okay. Well, um, unfortunately, I uh, well, I lived in Europe for a while, and I was even teaching in Denmark uh, at the beginning of the 90s, and I uh, was teaching transport economy. I remember that um, one, uh, two or three lessons were on the energy situation in the European Union. But now it was long time ago when the energy charter was about to be accepted. So, um, well. Prices are going down of gases, even even though in Europe are higher than in America, as you know. Uh, even though in Asia are much higher, uh, because that's LNG, you receive gas from Holland and from um, Russia. Um, carbon markets are also changing, as I said, and it could change more if um, some taxes are being incorporated uh, for environmental reasons. So probably uh, power companies will shift into gas or renewables than coal. Coal will be really um, punished. But, but uh, in the US, they are also developing technology. And I wanted to link it because technology is a double sword, of course. Uh, they are improving technology in order to reduce contamination from coal or they are developing, or they are um, obtaining liquids from coal to make them gasoline, and also to reduce the carbon emission. That's why I know that coal to, to liquids project. And on carbon sequestration, uh, Americans, uh, they don't like this kind of multilateral mechanism for abating green gas emissions, as we know, the Kyoto Protocol. But they are doing many things. It's incredible. At a different level, at the uh, federal and state level, in order to reduce uh, um, greenhouse emissions, mainly at the state level, California. Cali we have to watch California. It's a laboratory of pro probable future uh, environmental policy in the world because they are also making this um, uh, technology innovation for carbon sequestration. So carbon is not, uh, coal is not dead, but it's a, uh, markets are being uh, changing a lot. And I think that the most important geolo geolo geological implication for Europeans and for Chinese is that they are going to rely more and more on gas, not on coal, but on gas of, the, of Russia. And um, this is very well 
perceived by Americans. Americans, they are going to rely on their own resources or, in the worst of cases, on Canada, which is a close ally. And you know that Russians have a, a gas diplomacy. Uh, has, I, since I was studying in France, they had a gas diplomacy when they constructed a gas line to uh, supply Western Europe. So these major market changes are going to make stronger the Russian position in energy markets in Europe and in China, because China is, uh, um, as I showed, according to BP, BP scenarios, China is going to import more gas. Now, how this is going to impact, if I were an European, I would be more concerned, how is this going to impact cheap carbon, cheap gas, the introduction of new technologies, of renewables, which are more expensive, as far as I understand, not uh, wind, but solar. So if you have projects here, for example, on solar, how is this going to change? How is it going to stop? How is this going to discourage the evolution of solar energy? That's what I will, will be concerned in Europe. Because Europe, as we know, is much more advanced in terms of diversifying the portfolio of energy. That will be uh, my concerns in terms of uh, the impact of uh, coal and gas prices uh, here and the geopolitical implications in terms of Russia will be, we have a, a larger march of maneuver in terms of a gas, perhaps an oil. Have you seen the, the figures? Russia is very well positioned in terms of shale oil, gas and oil in Europe and in Asian markets. Okay. So thank you. The, we have a last question, and I think after we should close. I'm uh, Araceli. I'm also from Mexico. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So I know the problem with Mexico. Mexican power. Yeah. But um, I wonder very much about the, if this uh, technology is going to uh, get at all uh, co uh, economical competitive, uh, especially because uh, the environmental impact, which you mentioned. Um, uh, if we take into account not only the technology but all the production chain uh, to de deliver the service of energy, then uh, you have to consider, as you wisely pointed out, the infrastructure. And though, for example, uh, solar energy might be uh, or seem expensive, actually it might require less infrastructure uh, to, to be implemented. And in that case, uh, if you take and you consider all uh, this uh, production chain, it might not be so expensive as you expect to be. Uh, on the other side, you have to consider also all this uh, um, uh, impact in the production chains uh, of the technology um, that will uh, require a, a huge amounts of, of investments to yeah. make the production uh, either uh, less uh, uh, polluted or also make this end of pipe solutions to clean out all the mess that the technology does. So I actually, um, I also think it's um, uh, for Mexico especially, I think it will be, uh, especially for the geographical situation uh, that we have, maybe it's uh, still uh, paid on the uh, renewables in, in, instead of going after uh, these tendencies that the US always went to okay. impose and uh, then things think a little more about yeah. our own. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, Araceli, for your answer, which is correct. I mean, it's, it's a, but now, your question shows that it depends on the country, once again. Europe is a different scenario than Mexico. Why? Um, it happens that in Mexico we have a monopoly, a monopoly of production, and we have two monopolies, one for oil and gas, another one for electricity because you are talking more on, on the uh, power side of the question, because you're talking about uh, renewables, and most of the renewables are for uh, generating electricity so far. The problem with Mexico is that prices and tariffs are set not even by the electricity monopoly, Comisión Federal de Electricidad, but by that Treasury, the mutual of treasury. One point. Second point, the problem with Mexico is that all prices of electricity are subsidized. 
third point, that the generation of electricity in Mexico, because it's a monopoly, it, it, a dual monopoly, is mainly uh, generated by gas. Why? Because gas belongs to Pemex, which is the hydrocarbon monopoly. And we don't know, who knows? Nobody knows how much the electricity monopoly pays to Pemex to buy natural gas. It's a transfer, no transport. So we don't know the economics of generating electricity in Mexico. We only know the final price. And we know that the final price has a lot of subsidies, subsidies in gas, subsidies in the transmission of gas lines, and subsidies in the uh, final outlet, different kind of subsidies. If you are industrial, you have a monopoly. If you are a private monopoly. So prices are not transparent. And last but not least, but this is the worst, that since the sun does not belong to the nation, the sun does not belong to any monopoly, neither Pemex nor uh, the electricity monopoly are interested in exploiting sun, solar, solar energy. This is for privates, and we know uh, the uh, legislation was changed in Mexico since the inception of NAFTA, by the way. And uh, now private companies can produce mainly renewables. So the private, the production of um, renewable energy is in the hands of private investors now. It could be also developed by the state, but they don't care because they have the treasury, which is gas and oil. And Pemex is much more interested in investing. It's a question of opportunity cost in investing in oil, not in gas, not even in gas, because gas is cheap for them. In oil, because the rent will be higher if they enhance their oil exploitation because they can export. Talk with any engineer, middle engineer of Pemex, and they would say that. That's what is completely irrational. Not because gas is not a business, not because uh, sun is not a business, not because wind is not a business. It's because the way the Mexican uh, energy sector is being organized plays against that. And if I am a private investor in Mexico, it would be you, it could be a Dane, it could be a German, it could be a French, it could be a Mexican. It's very uh, risky to invest because you don't know the prices. You don't know whether the, uh, how to estimate the uh, long-term prices because of the subsidies, because uh, 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 the electricity monopoly is prefers to buy gas. If there is shale or cheaper gas, perhaps they will say, no, I prefer to uh, uh, burn uh, gas instead of buying you your son. So it's unsteady unless you make a long-term pact, and if, if possible. But in order to make a long-term agreement with CFE, which is, has a monopoly of transmission, you cannot sell. Uh, you cannot put your your um, um, your cable. That's it. You have to go through a monopoly. You have to have a long-term agreement. You can do it because they are already. But you have to play politics. You have to be inside the political situation. So uh, what economists call transaction costs are very high for um, uh, renewables in Mexico. In Mexico, which is not the case in, in Denmark. Mm -hmm. no, I think here the story would be different, hopefully. Transaction <laughs> uh -huh. costs are, 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 are low. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, on this note, I would like to thank you once again. I think uh, we can uh, applaud you once more. <laughs> Merci. Merci. Uh, I, I don't know how much you're available if people want to talk to I, you I now. I love to. I have, uh, you don't have to run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, still have, we still have, a, have an hour, no problem. Okay. So thank you very much for, for coming. I know it's the holiday period, and it was nice to see so many faces. Thank you for coming, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so see you soon. Bye. <laughs>